welcome everyone. Uh, we're actually going to get right into this webinar, but I want to introduce you our uh, guest presenter. Uh, if you've been on the Keyshot forums, you know him and you've probably seen his work. Nils of Pirma is with us today and he is a server integrator, but he's also a CG artist. His website is nilspirma.com and uh, if you need a render farm, if you're in need of some rendering, he is also the founder of clusterfarm.net, a Keyshot exclusive render farm. So check that out. He's going to break down his automotive rendering workflow for us today. So with that, Nils, take it away. So hi, my name is Nils Pirma, um, originally from Estonia in Europe, like right next to Russia and Finland. <laughs> um, so I suppose I'm sharing my screen already. Is that correct, Josh? Ron, we can see you. Ah, oh, cool. So great. Let's get into the nitty gritty and so, so on. So I'm gonna take it down a notch. So we're gonna go over front lights, emissive lighting, cloud of blasting, plus where it's needed, sample sizes, refraction LED lights. Uh, metal parts and plastic parts. Then we're going to go over to tail lights, blast geometry, emissive light settings, refraction samples, and whatnot. And then we're going to go to wheels and tires, since people have been asking me a ton about it. And I presume we can actually improve improve upon it as well uh, when I show you how I approach it and whatnot. So, well, well, let's get into Keyshot Seven. So here is my current scene. Uh, as you probably seen in the past, uh, actually in the webinar uh, banner, it's a Porsche 918. So we also talked about uh, there was a hint on we're gonna go over over some highlights and whatnot. So let's get started. So first of all, let's take on front lights. And here's a front lot of the 918. It's been materialized to the max, I can I can probably say. So here is front light. There's a glass in front. There are emissive lights in the back. Uh, you can probably see some depth into the lens as well. All right. So here are the front lenses. And cloudy plastics and de-electric um, glass materials here as well. So let's break this thing apart. Yeah, <laughs> not like correct camera, but anyways, so we took it apart. So here is the front lens. Here's the enclosure. The metal rim that you see saw inside <clears throat> the front lens uh, which is actually uh, the electric material as well and some emissive domes that we're going to use for the light source for this light as well then there's a couple of cloudy plastic materials here as well. I presume it's cloudy plastic. I don't know. Oh, it's still de-electric. De I've added some roughness into it uh, to get more scattering to the plastic parts and whatnot. And this actually improves upon the overall effect as well within the light uh, enclosure. So we go into the back. There's another one here. It's also de-electric, I suppose. Yep. Just a little bit of uh, roughness taken down. And there's metal part over here, and that's the back of the light. So let's close it back down. So <clears throat> the way that I actually approach these kind of lights is, first of all, I get the model. I prep the data in 3ds Max or some other program, SolidWorks and whatnot. And then I start to go into the real life images. 
So as you can probably tell, I've been looking at 918 images quite a lot. So I'm pretty familiar with this card at this point. At least I presume I am. Um, keep in mind that this model is not 100% accurate in terms of CAD data. So this is actually a Humpster 3D model that I've incorporated with the uh, with some other models as well to get some chrome details and whatnot. So I went here and I thought, okay, so I have these domes and uh, uh, which were these ones over here, and I tried to mimic it somehow. Uh, so I tried with glass and whatnot. I could kind of get the effect, but the best effect was with cloudy plastics and dielectric um, materials. So I went on and on. Uh, I tried to mimic the front lens. I tried to mimic the plastic on the enclosure, the metal. Um, and so I tried to mimic uh, the rear plastic as well since um, the emissive gives a little bit of depth into the whole plastic enclosure. As we can probably see, here's what it actually looks like in real life. And here's what it looks like in real life with it being fully lit. So that's what I tried to achieve. But since it's not an accurate model, <laughs> I, I did what I could basically with it. Um, so there's always been a setting that everybody seems to keep missing. Uh, they tend to put the emissive right on top of the lens structure, which is here. So if I were to go into here and turn it on to emissive, I don't have any depth within the front lens. But if I turn it off and go into a dielectric or a cloudy plastic and turn off the refraction index so I can get some uh, um, HDR data and reflections and whatnot, so basically have depth to it, then I can actually achieve what I try to achieve within this image, which is these dots and whatnot. So that's the main that was my main concern when I actually materialized this light in the first place. So let's take it apart again. So this was basically my goal to have scattering on this and on these lenses as well. Oh, so in terms of lights, front lights, I kept it on the minimal, but as you can probably tell, the electrics and cloudy plastic is the way to actually go to achieve any kind of depth within the enclosure of the of the light. So So do we have any kind of questions here? Josh, you're still here? Yep, yep. No questions okay. not quite yet. <laughs> not quite yet. Um, so yeah, and this has been my approach on lights for the past year or so. Uh, Keyshot 7 has made it possible to actually use uh, different um, different materials. So before I wanted to have, for example, achieve this cloudy plastics, I have to go into advanced mode in terms of the material, like um, have an advanced material, play around with the glossiness and whatnot to basically achieve the same goal. But often than not, it was not really setting, satisfying me quite enough. So with the introduction of Keysearch 7, I could finally put these advanced um, advanced approaches that I have been accustomed to in the past to the side and uh, basically focus on the new materials that I have been introduced into Kiso 7 
and fully take advantage of my setup and materialization. So that's basically it. So when I go into my into my scene here, hey, Neil. it's yeah, sure. So one question: Do you uh, use a separate object for emissive materials? Um, do you always use a, a separate object? Is one question. Uh, uh, the depends if the model as stock comes with any kind of domes within the lights itself then usually I do not go through the process of uh, adding additional geometry within to the light enclosure or behind the glass uh, if it is missing then sure I'll go over it and I will create a simple plane in the 3ds max or any kind of um, um, quad mesh uh, uh, object that will aid me in the process of actually giving the light source to the light. So fortunate for me with this model it actually came with uh, the domes behind the um, the front lights so I can just get straight into uh, prepping the data uh, in Keyshot 7 and just go from there on. Okay. And uh, do you have another material question uh, about the dielectrics that you used? Yep. I noticed that you use those for all. Um, the question is, why a dielectric material? Is it the most suited? For well, or plastic parts. Um, dielectric um, gives me, as you can probably see from this scene, uh, there's a metal uh, structure behind this. So, within the main, um, in the real life as well, the metal actually shines through and the dielectric gives me scattering within the material itself to actually have the light bounce to the metal. metal. If I were to turn the dielectric off and turn it into, for example, a, pl a clouded plastic, I would kind of lose the depth of that uh, material. So dielectric kind of, uh, with cloudy plastics you can achieve it, but as I can probably tell from this point, it's kind of providing me the thing that I need, but not quite. There's some scattering still that's not quite as okay as I would like in dielectric. So goes for the refractions on the front, as you can tell. So this is a cloudy plastic, but when I turn it to a dielectric and I turn the refraction up, then I have more possibilities. See, I can turn these refractions on. And with cloudy plastics, I simply cannot do it. At least I tried, but <laughs> I failed to actually achieve this uh, same scale of uh, same scale of uh, how to say. <laughs> I, I I can't put my finger on it at this point. Right. But yeah, I, we'll let you get through the rest of it. We'll do uh, more. Uh, more Q&A at the end here, so get your questions in and we'll answer them along the way or ask Nils to explain them. Thanks, Nils. Yeah, sure. Yeah, not a problem. So, we've gone over the front light. Uh, anybody can use whatever material they want, but if they have a situation like this with the 918, for example, that is a Humpster 3D model, then presumably this would be a better option. Uh, and these are the material, materials I would use. In terms of the metal, um, as my mentor and um, as my person that I looked up to when I was starting Keyshot, who was Tim Fur, uh, he actually told me as well, uh, just don't use chrome on every part you see. Try to keep it on a minimal but try to achieve some metallic shine within metal. 
So yeah, when I turn it off, I can turn it into Chrome, but now I get some light scattering here, but in the actual model, it's more of a roughness material. Same goes for the front. Um, I usually like to actually implement uh, the metallic paint for this as well. And now with the op uh, additional option of having a clear coat on top of it and adjusting its refraction and reflectiveness, it's actually uh, basically I like it more than actually going into the metal itself and tuning it from there on. So, so I, I kind of like this look better, although it's it's metallic paint with clear coat on it. But this for me it looks kind of cool. And when we turn into performance mode, the, the metal itself kind of looks the same. Well, not exactly, but still. Uh, Let's try it on the ridges on, on here and see if this makes any kind of impact, substantial impact. So, I don't know. <laughs> I like this one actually better. Um, I turn the metal coverage on, clear coat roughness on even more. So, metal roughness. So, yeah, I think this will do just fine. Okay, so I think for now I'm pretty much done with the front part of the light. Let's just see, let's put down the lens as well. I'm just let let it and sit for a second here until it refracts itself and so we get a better rich raised image. So as we can probably see from here, we have nice uh, lighting uh, within the enclosure. Uh, we have some scattering in the dielectric, uh, which is uh, right next to the emissive lights. We have a nice depth in terms of the front lenses on top of the IES lights, I mean emissive lights, and this would be the one I would consider rendering in general. So I would render this out uh, with the car without any hesitation because in my perspective it looks good. So I think that we should be done with the front lights, but if there isn't any questions, then we're going to answer them in the Q&A at the end of the session. Okay. Hey, Nils, I have a quick question, actually. Uh, for the sure. materials that you're using here, are you pulling those out of the library? Um, no. Or are you creating uh, those all from scratch? I'm basically going the route of um, uh, skipping the drag and drop solution altogether. I'm basically generating all my materials with the material editor or the ones that provided. I can go into material graph as well, but that's that rarely happens. If I if there's something that I don't like within this material editor, then I'll go into material graph. But altogether in terms of drag and drop the materials that I you that we all used to do in the past, that's uh, that's in the past. Interesting. So, do you ever find yourself creating materials that you can see yourself using in another scene in the future and saving that to the library, or are you really starting from scratch in each scene? Uh, depends. Um, uh, because I'm doing this as a freelancer most of the time, I, when I find a need that I would actually like to save it, but as we see, every scene is somewhat different. So usually when it comes to like wheels and tires and some emissive lights and some colorful plastics, then I might save them, but uh, I like to I like to skip the phase of just applying a previously used material on my models. So I'd like to basically start from scratch. 
but it has happened in the past where I have used drag and drop uh, in my previous um, uh, library to actually drop materials onto new models. All right, cool. So let's move on to rear lights. The thing that everybody is bugging me about. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just saying. Um, I'm kind of a joker today, so um, I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let it sit for a second. Um, so with the approach of rear lights, I also like to do the same with front lights. I like to go into Google, look at their image references, and try to come up with a way to actually achieve the same goal, uh, uh, same kind of realism, um, as opposed to just basically doing a mist of light like on top of the glass and call it that. So with this one, I try to mimic the same thing. So as we can see, the glass is red, but the under underneath the glass we have a yellow light. Uh, the yellow light actually is the running daytime light as we can see here, and it's a uh, geometry. It's uh, basically an LED ring that has been uh, lit from both ends with LEDs, and it's basically a cloudy plastic in itself that, uh, due to its scattering probabilities, uh, it actually shines up as one big geometry block, which is round. So in here, I tried to achieve the same thing but I struggled with it a little bit, so I decided instead that since if there is geometry behind, um, so for example, I'm going to move this part real quick. See, the light turns red, although I have red glass. But whatever kind of color I try to apply this, uh, uh, LED geometry too, it kind of fails in that regard that I cannot get the color out of this glass material. Uh, I've tried with cloudy plastics, I've tried with just uh, transfer materials, I've tried with uh, glass and uh, solid glass and dielectrics and whatnot, and I have failed to do so. So I found out um, a nicer way to actually approach this. So what I did was I took the light geometry, which is here, which are these two geometry lines that go around uh, inside a glass, and instead of it putting, putting it underneath, I put it slightly on top of the glass. So if we go a little deeper into this, you can see that there is a ridge, so that means that this geometry is protruding out of the actual glass, so it's moved a slight bit. And what I did is I added another piece of geometry, which in terms now is just white, basically. There is, since there these are not scaled properly, there is a situation where the geometry in terms of the slight enclosure overlaps the bottom geometry. I'll try to find a way, <laughs> or actually properly scaling it, to get the best end results without this happening. But due to it being inside the car body, I'm actually not too concerned about this uh, overlapping geometry because I'll be maybe watching it from this angle, and since it's inside the uh, body of the car, I don't really see it. And the further away I go, the more, I mean, the less apparent it actually seems. So this was the approach to get some kind of color, colorized um, view into the red glass itself. So I'm going to edit material, undo the hide part. And now when I go into colors, I can still keep the red glass underneath and I can play around. What heck not? Let's turn blue, for example. So the limits just 
became non-existent at this point with this. So I try to use orange since if you look at these lights, for example, you kind of see orange in them a little bit, maybe more like white. But you can fine tune it to your liking. But I suggest, high, I mean, I high, highly recommend doing your research in terms of lights and keeping it uh, next to you when you actually do your materiali materialization. So when we look at here, this is 9-11, Career 4. So there's a hint of white and there's a hint of orange. So I could do a color grading shade here where I could keep these parts next to the edges um, orange. And for example, have the gradient turn white or a lighter color within the center of the geometry. Uh, I could do it now, but I'm going to have to try it out first because I'm not really sure about it actually happening. And we don't want to waste another hour for basically me to go and trial and error with this. So I'll presumably when I come with a solution that is actually feasible, then I will actually demonstrate it on the Keyshot forums and whatnot. <coughs> Sorry. So this is another way you can get um, the actual actual light to basically scatter. One thing I'm going to actually try out right now is usually what happens is these lights scatter. You know, they become a little bloomy and whatnot. The first thing, obviously, as a keyshot person I would do is go into image and turn on bloom effects. Yeah, sure, it works to a certain extent. I mean, it actually looks pretty cool. <laughs> I can turn it on and off, but now when the thing that happens is the scene actually turns kind of dreary and bloomy and whatnot. So I would turn it off, and I would go into the material and perhaps give it a little bit of roughness and give it a little bit of dispersion. Perhaps we can achieve the scattering of the light a little bit. So it kind of works and it kind of doesn't, so I'm going to have to look over it as well. But if you're like dead on to the image and just want to have bloom effects going on and you want to scatter the light, you can do it with the effects tab. I mean the image tab and turn on the effects as well. So this would actually look pretty cool in the end of the car, I mean in the, in the rear especially if I would add a little bit of hint of white into that gen center of the ge geometry, that will pretty much look dead on in, in terms of my eyes, for, for at least. Um, so, uh, again, as I used here, uh, I used the electric. Um, I can try to go into cloudy plastics as well. I'm going to turn this off. Okay, I'm just going to focus this camera. This is becoming annoying. <laughs> um, so let's... So this is the kind of scattering I was talking about. See on the edges? It be kind, of, kind of becomes dispersed. I mean, it scatters out. But that's due to the cloudiness more than anything, I presume. Transparency distance, I'm going to bump it up to 10. I, I, I don't bother going into the real degree and such. So cloud and color is going to be red. Scattering. It's going to be zero. Roughness, I'm going to take it down, down it 
down a notch. And here's a little bit of scattering, at least with clouded plastics. So this is in performance mode. You can see what I've basically done. Uh, these red lines in here as well are part of the light. Uh, you can see it here as well. See these lines actually are individually lit with LEDs. Oh, here's a good example, for example. Um, again, this red line, these small fins, they're all individually lit, or it's a combination of uh, a plastic material that has been roughed or uh, coated with or sandblasted to its refractive point, and it's actually been individually lit with LEDs and whatnot. So this is what actually they do with uh, in real life with plastics is um, if we w they want to scatter a light, uh, for example, if you go into the street and you see a glowing sign and it has a glass in front of it and there's also a text w in carved into the um, into glass and when you sh shine light through that glass, the engraved part, which is actually being uh, cut out or it's being uh, sandblasted and whatnot, will shine through, but the glass still remains as transparent material. Same goes for... Yeah, people are... I'm going to get flack for this, probably, but people look, why aren't you going an Audi? You're an Audi guy. <laughs> But yeah, I, because I had a 918 available, I tried. I wanted to do something uh, different this time around. Then this is what I tried. Oh, here's a good example of that same light. Let's see now, it's got a bit. I could turn up the emissive lights as well, but I'm not going to do it this time. But this is what it basically does. This, this is the kind of goal I try to achieve. This is like brake lights going full blast at the moment. So, I think I'm pretty much done with the rear lights as well at this point. Let's check the time real quick. Oh, we're halfway over to through the webinar. Almost. We can, we can still go, keep on going. So, this is what you can actually do with, if you have double geometry, or if you don't have these um, uh, geometry parts that are giving you the, the light source, then you can model them yourself in 3ds Max or try to find a way to actually implement the existing uh, geometry that you have or use an opacity map to map out uh, pre-existing geometry and try to add emissive uh, materials to that. Uh, it's. I have done it in the past where the models, uh, let me pick this re up real quick. I'm going to go into everything, search everything. So I'm going to go into R8 demo and we're going to go and open up another instance of an R8. Yes, I've turned out it for the current being. <laughs> so I'm going to open this file and in the front you can see that I have a plane and underneath it I have an emissive uh, light. This plane actually itself is completely flat. What I did in if I want to get these ridges, I added the bump map. So if you're close to that uh, front light and you want some kind of bumps uh, within that light, uh, then you could use uh, clouded plastic or any kind of other plastic and you can play around with the bump map to get these ridges going. So this is applied throughout the front light. Let me see if I just can scroll into it real quick. So underneath is just an emissive plane, with, which I had generated in the past. 
I basically took the front geometry, pushed it towards the back, saved it as another material, put image of light on top of it. Uh, I left it on the back, uh, took the original geometry that it was in the front. I added a bump map to it uh, as a cloud of plastic. And then I basically fine tuned it. And here's the effect. Although, yes, I know it's bluish and tinge. But I can fine tune it later on to basically get my effect. But this is one way of actually getting this uh, ridged effect with pre-existing geometry. Just slightly move it to the back because most of the, uh, most of the cars these days, at least from my believe it was from 2012, and have started to use LED light strips which are basically these, uh, how to say this, uh, basically plastic strips that are being lit by LEDs and they're pretty strong and they have heat sinks in, uh, behind them to cool the LEDs. But the LEDs, as I talked in the plus with the uh, glass theory of the signs, is basically the same technology. So this is one way of doing it with uh, pre-existing geometry that you don't even have to go into modeling in 3ds max or whatever kind of 3d software that you're using so this is one of the demos i basically took this r8 into this uh, into the key shot just to demonstrate this i have better r8 uh, <laughs> more mockups than this one but this is just to demonstrate the light strips on the front so we're going to discard this and we're going to go forward and we're going to go into wheels and tires. Now this is a topic where uh, w which everybody seems to be interested in. Uh, what people usually do is, okay, Josh told me to keep it as advanced as possible, <laughs> but I'm going to down, dump it down a little. So what people usually do is, yeah, they go into the, the material uh, material library, they go into the tire, to drag and drop it onto the tire, and basically we call it that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's more to it than just drag and drop. There's labels, um, roughness, refraction, uh, the plastic material itself, uh, and whatnot. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm just going to focus in on this logo, set camera target. So this is my tire that I materialized today. As you can see, there's quite a bit of, quite a lot of action going on within this tire. So um, keep in mind that this tire itself is actually a CAD model. Uh, so it's pretty accurate in terms of the actually, actual tire data. So what do we have here? So as we can probably see, there are um, marks on the tire. There are bumps on the tire that actually are refracting, refracting as well. There's some dust in the tire. And the center part of the tire seems to be more worn out and has more dirt and grime uh, to the middle part of the tire mm, rather than on the edges. So, I'm going to uh, save this material, if I haven't already. No, 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 that's not this. Uh, accurate tire. I'm going to paint mold tech. Um, so, I'm just going to... I'm going to see if this actually works. So here's uh, what it basically started up with. This is a pretty refractive uh, tire. The reason why I went with a re uh, refractive tire is because I wanted to for example, I have a lights here that are actually shining on top of here. I can increase the roughness and I can 
get it a little bit more realistic. But then I thought, well, yeah, okay, it looks good enough to me, but yet again, it's basically drag and drop material, which everybody can use the sliders to adjust. I'm going to put this back on. No. Um, so what I did was a couple of weeks or a couple of months back, I came to the conclusion that hmm, most of the tires these days in terms of Uh, most of these tires um, are flat, but in real life, what happens is that there's grime and dirt kicking up uh, in the middle section of the tire, if it's correctly balanced, and there's dirt uh, happening on the sides as well, and they become they will have wear and tear onto them as well so I don't want to have a factory standard tire on every scene I do especially if it's a running scene uh, uh, basically a translation scene where a car is driving and their wheels are rotating and they all kind of look like flat uh, to me so I wanted to keep some little bit of detail within those tires to actually see that they have a little bit of wear and tear where they look realistic to me at least and to basically get more depth within the tire uh, and if there's a client that actually comes up to me and says oh your the tires are kind of flat try to do something else and when they go and do something else uh, they actually say well that actually looks pretty realistic so this is my same goal that I tried to achieve with labels so I'm going to go into edit material. As you can probably tell, I have no textures. This is not a uh, bump map here, which is the text. This is a uh, separate geometry uh, for this scene alone. Mm, I mean for this model alone. So what I went and did the first time was I took the ge uh, textures and I just basically drag and drop them on to this uh, tire. Let's see if I can do it again. And what I did was, no, cancel. What I did was I adjusted the brightness of it. See, when I adjust the brightness, it comes more darker and more uh, lighter but okay what if we took the opacity off it will just look like this so instead of leaving at this I went in to the textures again and thought oh perhaps I could use some kind of opacity map to keep it constrained in the middle part of the tire instead of just being like this, which is just currently. So I went to opacity, I turned it on, I adjusted to the cylinder, as you can probably see. So the cylinder was my main point of reference so I can adjust the width of the tire, uh, of the texture, and also I can repeat it and whatnot. But do keep in mind, you have to turn off sync. So when you have first put your material uh, here, which is actually a texture, if you turn the sink on, then it will resize the width and the length of the actual uh, diffuse material that we have here. And so they will actually basically synchronize together but we don't want to have it. We want to manipulate every single piece of the mapping separately. So it turns sync off. So yeah, I did that. And then I actually went into, I unlocked it and basically played around with width. So I turn it off, it turns, turns. 
And as we can probably tell, if we turn it a little bit more, uh, oh yeah, it's too bright. <laughs> And if we do it now, see now it becomes on the sidewall as well. And turn it down, the sidewall becomes more to the parent material that I have underneath. And now it constrains it to the middle section of the tire where we actually wanted it to be. So this is the way you can achieve this worn out look in the middle. So after that, I thought, okay, well, yeah, this looks good to me, in at least in my eyes. But most of the people that do tire models and whatnot, and they actually showcase their models on TurboSquid with all their mapping and whatnot, I wanted to achieve the same goal, but just using KeyShot, no UV mapping beforehand, and add my labels to actually get that effect. So there's a little bit of grime and dirt now added onto it in the same way that the middle part uh, of the wear and tear was applied as well. Same goes for the opacity map and whatnot. So I thought, okay, yeah, we have dirt and grime now onto the tire as well. But there's ir irregularities within the tire itself. So there's slight bits of that are dropped and slight... Uh, other bits that are on top as well so the tire basically becomes irregular so I thought okay let's try some bump maps for example just bump maps uh, and just basically odd out the bump maps uh, with opacity so that way I achieved these little imperfections within the tire that are uh, slightly seeable, I mean visible, um, but really aren't that eye-popping, but just to get the basics of the tire. So that way, I, if I do want to showcase the wheel itself, then these irre irregularities will eventually pop up in the uh, large render uh, that I will be rendering or outputting in the end so that gives it more like yeah it looks like worn out a bit it looks more realistic so there are there's a little fine uh, I mean a lot of fine tuning to get the material correct and so I went a little bit further okay so, hey, Neil, yeah, Josh? can you show the material graph for the tire there some are interested in seeing that uh, actually, I didn't do it in material graph. Well, well, okay. <laughs> I think wanting to see what it looks like after you've done all that. Okay, so I'm actually curious to see actually how it looks itself. Uh, let me yeah, so pop it in. Everyone who is wondering about that, he, he didn't get into the material graph to do that, but you can see that it actually constructs it as yeah. it went through. So. Yeah, it's just... I like the idea to have the material graph, but in some cases, the ease of use with labels to achieve the same goal is basically my way of approaching things. And being uh, creative within the process is actually aiding to uh, get the end result as well. So yeah, the material graph looks pretty complicated at least to me since I'm not really into the usage of material graph but as you can see they're all bound to labels they're all plastic labels basically and they have their own texture mapping and whatnot so this is what the material graph tree is like cool thanks Nils yeah sure no problem so I'm gonna keep on going with this so I thought yeah okay so these bumps and whatnot irregularities within the tire actually look pretty cool but I thought, okay, it's missing a little bit of zing more. So when a tire spins, it actually scrapes off the tire's uh, structure itself. So, for example, an I-18 is a pretty fast car, as we all know. Um, 
so I try to add little scrapes uh, where the tire spins up the first time when the when you hit the accelerator real fast and it proves uh, it scrapes lines within the tire itself so I added another plastic material that I actually stretched far out and also added the bump map and opacity map to it to basically achieve the scraping of the tire. Uh, it's all visible uh, on the edges, also on the on the center. Uh, I could constrain it to more to the center, but I want to have the tire to have the actual scraping on the sides as well a little bit since when you accept, hit the accelerator the pressure within the tire gets uh, constrained to the contact point of the tire itself so that way the tire actually flattens out and you basically use more uh, more uh, surface area of the tire so that basically proves that that at that point in time, the edges of the tire were actually used uh, within the acceleration process. And that's what I basically tried to achieve here as well. The other thing that people are uh, missing within the whale wheels are uh, most people, well, this is carbon ceramic. I, at least I tried to get more carbon ceramic look into it is basically they go into the material uh, library again to search for uh, uh, spiral I think it was or radial yeah radial brushed so it's stainless steel right that's radial radial brushed and they basically applied with a slap bang onto the middle of the material and basically called that uh, well you could do that but you have to fine-tune it as well they're fine-tuning um, because when you apply this material here, let's go into performance mode. Yeah, the mapping is quite bad. Part. Let's go 1000. Everything's good with 1000. See, it looks like they have been scraped. And when I turn the roughness off, it starts to lose its depth a little bit. See, before I had carbon ceramic and it looked pretty good. But I'm seeing that, okay, well, from the reflection of the backup geometry, the grooves themselves are pretty deep. So I try to, because bump height, I will keep it lower, 0 0.5. And now it starts to look like it kind of looks realistic and whatnot, but still it it looks kind of odd. Uh, so let's use C, used break disc. So it's shining. Okay. So the grooves, they're, you don't see them that much. So the grooves are really, really small. Because when you see the reflection on the brake caliper itself, see the reflections are pretty clear although you can see the lines inside the reflections yet again are pretty uh, are um, are really visible they're clean looking so instead of like going on okay yeah I'm, I'm gonna put the uh, stainless steel radio brush material onto it you're gonna have to fine-tune a lot and since this bump map is really not quite cut out for this work because it's uh, at least I've seen in the past where this uh, material uh, that using is using the map the map itself is 
quite low resolution. Thus, we cannot get the full effect of it. So I'm going to bump it, tone it down a bit, and I'm going to go back to my carbon ceramic. <coughs> so this carbon ceramic is pretty much exactly set up with the roughness and refractions. Uh, carbon, ah, let's go into Koenig's uh, CC. Uh, I'll, Agar R break disk. So you can see it, there's uh, caustics going on in within this uh, material. So we can tell right away that it's pretty refractive. But it looks kind of pale. Uh, I mean, kind of flat. But in truth, carbon ceramic, at least I've seen carbon ceramic breaks with my own eyes, I know that for a fact that they're pretty refractive once you shine a light onto them. So although the texture might look, is not quite the right because this is a, a material that I grabbed from my pre-existing cars library, although it's not correct by any means in terms of the uh, in terms of the overall structure of the texture, it still provides some realism in towards of seeing carbon ceramic breaks. So you can fine tune them as well. Try to use correct texture and try to adjust it. Yeah. Hey there, Nils. Uh, we're running pretty short on time here I know some people were wondering about the metallic paint material and some were wondering specifically about settings that you use both on lighting settings and then the render output uh, okay so I'm gonna on those yeah sure oh okay where the so Okay, we're going to gonna put on rebounces. So okay, we're gonna go over the material. So I've done a personal environment uh, with the new and improved HDR editor within QShot 7. So I try to lay on uh, the. I'm gonna turn off these lights for a second. These are highlights. So I try to get the. Shoulder of the car, the front uh, uh, windshield, and the edges of the car as well. So the material itself is actually metallic paint. So I adjust the sliders and samples to actually smooth out the paint itself. And with the clear coat, I went into a little bit deeper to give it a lighter bluish tinge to it. So. Before we had to adjust the material itself uh, in terms of the metal color and whatnot to get basically the same effect. But now we can fine tune the color with the um, clear coat. So we can have clear coat roughness, for example. Uh, refraction index, how much the clear coat actually refracts and whatnot. And the thickness. So when we turn it off, now is the uh, parent material. So when we turn it back on, then the blue tinge becomes apparent. So this is um, how I approach with uh, metallic paints. Uh, the base color also, in some case, at least I, for example, always like to keep it on darker side of things. And the metal color actually is providing the shine and the clear coat have to be lighter than the base color. So I thought, okay, yeah, so this looks pretty cool. Um, how about I add some real good highlights to these body panels, which is the shoulder line, the front uh, top of the fender, and some front in the back, uh, also in the front, and get some real nice shadows going on. So what I did, was I added spheres basically from the edit add geometry and from the sphere menu and then I placed it um, and I placed 
it's a very various amount of them. I didn't scale them down, but what I did was I added the IES profile lights to it and basically dragged and dropped them onto these spheres, uh, then adjusted their um, uh, multiplier to fit my uh, preferred uh, uh, highlight uh, uh, strength and then I fine-tuned them to the correct position where I actually wanted to see them so this was one of them is shining here on the front one of them is shining right below the light in front second one is shining on top of the fender here third one is shining on top of the side and the fourth one is actually shining from the back towards the rear wheel and what IES also does is prove this uh, shadow a sharp shadow underneath if you turn the radius up a little bit then we can actually uh, blur out the shadows as well so somebody asked me about render settings so there was an animation but I don't want to do it so usually what Tim Tim the mentor has told me in the past has always been that if you choose to render your car always in the middle of the sheet metal of the car in the samples try to bump them up as much as you can everything else that is not really needed you can bump down to uh, well where actually quality is not needed you can bump them down to the uh, preferred uh, Psi uh, value where the balance between quality and quantity of light and the material material quality actually is on the fine line. So what I usually do, since glass usually relies on ray bounces, the more ray bounces you have, the more light between the glass panels you will have. Also some cases uh, in terms of jewelry and whatnot you want to use global illumination and especially if you have a scene where you want to shine when you want to where you want to um, have light within the car itself uh, shine on then global illumination provides you that flexibility so what I usually do in at least for car scenes I try to use eight samples uh, for uh, ray bounces and 15 to up to 35 for the samples themselves to get my metal uh, uh, sh looking good. Uh, also with flakes and whatnot applied. And usually what I do is I don't render, although I have 24 cores available at all times, <coughs> I still prefer to render it on my render farm because that way I can uh, have, I can have flexibility in, in terms of time uh, so I can work on another render while the first one is rendering on, on the farm so that's where cluster farm comes in so that provides me flexibility and also gives me a more mm, gives me more uh, options in terms of refining my scene as well so if I'm if I want to try to render a scene out like where we at where we are at right now, I wouldn't suggest doing it in the first place. I would use the most heavy parts of the car and do a regional render first. That way, I know whether or not the the settings that I used uh, are actually providing me the quality that I need in my uh, output so that way if if these settings don't correctly apply in regional render then if I render it out from now on and leave my computer to render overnight and I come back and I'm not satisfied with the quality then without this pre-check I basically wasted a ton of time so try to do regional renders first and then decide upon your quality 
and uh, your sample sizes and ray bounces and whatnot, or also anti-aliasing, global illumination, and uh, so on. So uh, I should highly recommend doing reasonable renders before actually going into full production mode. So we're going to turn that off. Um, so, Josh, I think I have pretty much covered everything that I, I know. All right. Um, have a few questions here. Let's see. Um, one other person was asking how often you modify your CAD geometry and what uh, sort of workflow, if you need to update any of that geometry that you use. Well, usually it depends. Um, if it's like stuff like this that I know from the get-go that it's uh, good, uh, also I'll, I'm still going to have to prep the data anyways. It's like basically take an OBJ or FBX file and drop it in. But usually I go into 3ds Max, I take everything, every geometry part and grouping and whatnot, I take them all apart. I first, <laughs> this is an OCD perhaps, <laughs> but I first go into the model and look at the rear and front lights. I see whether or not I can use that geometry to, uh, I mean, whether or not I can use the existing geometry to get the best result in the, in the long run. If that geometry in the front or rear lights or brake discs or whatnot is not there, then I will model them. So before I go into Keyshot, I want to make sure that every part of my my data is there. If it's not, within the first couple of five minutes, I don't find it, and it's proving not useful for me for me to have that model, and I lack something. Then I I don't close 3 ds Max just yet, just because I've imported this model. I go back in, I model the part that I need, and then I update the, ge the geometry. But this rarely happens because I re get really nitty gritty. Uh, in terms of uh, getting the model itself prepped first before going on to Keyshot. Thanks. So any other? And some people had uh, questions on gradients, and you mentioned about using them in the in the lights. Can you yeah grab that a little? Uh, gradients. So what gradients pr basically do in terms of lights and whatnot. Um, Gradients basically odd out, in, in terms of opacity, for example, gradients odd out uh, the light shining through the material. So if there's a white part of the gradient and a black part of the gradient, if you don't want light going coming out from the uh, black part of the gradient, you leave it black. If you want it to shine through on the white part of the gradient, which is where light... Um, in, uh, for example, glass shines through, then you leave it white. And you fine tune the balance between width and length to actually get that going for you. So this is what exactly I did in the 918, I mean the Audi R8 um, uh, front light. Basically, I repeated the, um, the opacity map, uh, which was a pattern of gradient, and I uh, I scaled it to the uh, correct limit that I actually wanted to use it. Uh, I have demonstrated in the, in the in the previous uh, um, tutorials on my on my YouTube channel as well, and it will you will see it on the recording of the webinar as well. I just don't don't want to open another file up and waste the resources. But this is how usually you do it, gradients. Okay, All so right. just another one. On, on that note, um, I know you bought this file, so it's probably not available for um, to let the watchers have a look at it. Do you have any scenes that might be available on your site or YouTube that people could examine? Actually, uh, this, since this... Uh, license has already expired, and I'm not going to use this uh, in, in 
any kind of commercial or production uh, sets. I'm going to dumb it down uh, just a little bit. Oh, look, Jonathan. Uh, I'm going to basically tone it down in terms of the scene sets and whatnot, and I'm going to make it publicly available to download anyways in the uh, upcoming week or so. Right. Um, some more questions on uh, settings. How do you keep render files small? Uh, the size small. Does that is that a concern? Um, when you have the uh, four terabytes of a data store, then usually it's not a problem. The most amount of data that uh, uh, actually will make your Keyshot file large is the object data, the model data itself, how large is your actual import model, and the HDR uh, dome lighting, how big is your file size in terms of the HDR. That confines with all the lighting data and whatnot. Uh, so there's three levels, uh, object data, lighting data, and uh, HDR dome data that actually puts your file into the size. So the smaller the file sizes you have using for the HDR modeling lighting, uh, for example, IES takes uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, data as well. Uh, the smaller you keep those files, the smaller your uh, BIP or KSP file will be. Uh, KSP also compresses it twice as much almost. So it all comes down to the model and the HDR data that actually defines your uh, Keyshot file um, file size. All right, and uh, one more. Is there a reason uh, why you decided to keep caustics turned uh, turned off? Um, yeah, uh, caustics uh, are that good in terms of wheels, for example. For example, uh, the shininess of the rim will not correctly shine on top of the refracting ground with caustics, and it will provide artifacts. As you can see, I'm starting to create dots here and there. It's a matter of ray tracing. Uh, you can render them separately, but I've seen it in the past. They aren't that accurate in terms of car renderings. Yes, you can use them, but I would say that to render them separately, not within the same scene. But I personally don't like to use caustics uh, within my scenes. I rarely use them. If it's like glass material or diamonds and whatnot, then sure, it, be, it comes handy and it will provide more light scattering. But in car renders, I like to keep them off. It's just a personal preference. It might work for some people. It might not might not work for other people. But in my terms, I distinctly would keep it off. Oh, one other thing. <laughs> So people in the Keyshot forum have asked me, okay, so you did this, what's this? That is a fully 3D modeled uh, interior scene. So when you look at the M4 in the Amazing Shots forum, then this is not a backplate. This is a fully 3D model scene. Um, Josh, can we? Can I demonstrate them uh, real simply how you can create an HDR from uh, uh, 3D model data. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It takes me, because in the in the past uh, of the Keyshot introductions, uh, there has been a lack of demonstrating a new feature of actually creating panoramic views of the... Uh, if you have, a, for example, if you have a scene and you want to render an HDR from it, then there hasn't been a much, much data provided on how you can do it. I part. So I'm gonna use. 
I'm going to put the camera into here. And then I'm going to go into, was it stereo? Oh, no, it wasn't stereo, but it was. You need to change your, there you go. Yeah, and then I go into preview map. Uh, I can tone it down, the camera height and whatnot, but right now I'm seeing the 3D, 360 degree sphere as a panoramic preview in Keychat 7. So if I wanted to see what the preview map is going to be, this is going to be basically the HDR that I would render out. And you would render out with the um, EXR data. So you choose it to be EXR and uh, if you render out a CXR uh, in an advanced mode or maximum samples or whatnot, the scene that you actually see, see in the preview map will be your eventual EXR. The size of your EXR will depend on you. Uh, also, it will inherently, uh, the more, the bigger you select like 20K resolution, the larger the file size is going to be and the lo longer it will take to actually render it. But this is how, from panoramic view, you can actually get into the mode uh, of a 3D scene to actually render out HDR. HDR. Um, am I doing this correctly, Josh? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> yeah, that's how you do it. Yeah, so the one question answered <laughs> for the people that actually want to do HDR from 3D data. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, we pl uh, we're planning on getting more info out about uh, little little things like that in Keyshot 7 we haven't got a, a quick tip or anything well there's a so. there's another reason for me to create another webinar <laughs> Very good. All right well <laughs> we're at uh, 20 minutes past now so uh, thank you very much Nils for breaking down your process for us um, again check out his work at nilsfirma.com and if or instagram.com slash Nils there you go <laughs> And uh, also clusterfarm.net if you need some rendering speed there. And um, yeah, visit on the forum. He's there a lot and gives a lot of great uh, advice. If you want to share your car renders, I'm sure he'd uh, be, be up for giving some feedback on what you're doing. And again, thanks a lot, Nils. And we will be, re this is recorded, we'll be posting it here on YouTube and at keyshot.com. So thanks again, everyone. Yeah. Have a great week.